matter who you are, where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. God breaks in our lives, sometimes when we're on the road and changes everything. God breaks into our lives with a call, with an invitation, with the truth, with love, and calls us to be God's people again. May God interrupt our lives and infuse us with love and God's concern that we might be more whole. Let us pray. O God of love, forgive us when we are blind to your way and overzealously defend the truth, drawing lines between us and them as an attempt to protect our way of being. O God of love, forgive us when we misunderstand our calling and think that it serves you to hold violence in our hearts towards those with whom we disagree. Come to us on our own Damascus road. Stop us in our tracks. Soften our hearts, show us yourself, and give us the courage to fulfill our genuine calling, we pray. Amen. A reading this morning that comes from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. It's Paul's conversion, and his old name was Saul, and in this passage, um, he is striking out and suddenly becomes changed in the middle of it. Meanwhile, Saul, who was still breathing threats of murder against the disciples, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if they found anyone who claimed to be a Christian, men or women, they would bring them back to Jerusalem, bound and tied. He was going along, getting near to Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Paul asked, who are you? And the reply came, I am the Christ with whom you are persecuting. Get up and enter the city and you will be told what to do. Now at that time, men were traveling with him, stood there speechless because they heard this voice, but they saw no one. Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could not see anything. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Our second reading is from also from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 10 through 20. Now there was also a disciple, Ananias, in Damascus. And the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, he called. And Ananias answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the house of Judas. Look for a man named Saul. And at this moment, Saul is praying, for he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias who will come in and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from so many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind up all who invoke your name. But God said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. So Ananias went and he entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up, and he was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Let us pray. God of love, Show up when we need you most. When our hearts are hard, when our heads are held too high, 
when our feet are heading for trouble, when we are blocked from each other. Oh God, keep showing up and help us to see you. Help us to orient ourselves around your love and to see how your love and justice are never filled with division or fear or hatred. Help us to see instead how your love and justice are always filled with grace and humility and courage. Open our hearts this day, O God, to your blind, siding spirit. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Last weekend, I was blindsided by the flu um, all weekend, tucked away in bed, and so I wanted to give a shout out to Chuck, who covered for me. So I've been <clears throat> on deck to preach for a couple weeks, and here we go. Um, but Chuck and Mark held down the fort because Julie was away um, on spring break, and so I'm grateful for our staff, for my great colleagues, and Dan, you too. So what does it mean to be blindsided? I emailed Tim Freeman, Christchurch member, college football athlete, and football coach, to get his perspective. And according to Tim, when you are blindsided in football, you don't see a hit coming. He continues, as a quarterback, you prepare your mind and your body. You work hard in the off season, you study film, you recognize the defense and you give all of your effort on every play. You drop back into the pocket and you prepare to throw and then bam, you wake up on the ground with a 300 pound lineman on your back, wondering what day it is and what your name is. That hit from nowhere can physically and mentally break you. It can cause you to blame others and to perform poorly going forward. Mike Tyson had a saying that I think about many times. Everybody has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. Sometimes we are blindsided by the goodness of life. We are bowled over by love, by a second chance, by a new opportunity. We are given exactly what we need in exactly the right moment when we least expect it. We are healed or freed from the burden that we have carried for so long. According to Anne Lamont, a progressive Christian author, an appropriate and prayerful response in these moments is, wow. And even when we step back and really let the moment sink in, thank you, God, thank you. Other times, we are blindsided by the brokenness of our human condition and our wider world. We are laid low by the loss of a loved one, by cancer, or the loss of a job. We experience an anti-miracle. We are in the exact wrong place at the exact wrong time. We also suffer under the weight of systems that are broken. And these systems perpetuate so much inequality and suffering for the marginalized and for all of us because they divide us from each other. And again, according to Anne Lamont, an appropriate response in these moments is to cry out to God and to each other with a simple prayer, help. Either way, when we are blindsided, we gain a new perspective. We see our communities, ourself, and our God in a new way. New things are brought into our line of vision, which were on the periphery before. Some details come into sharper focus, and others, the ones that seem to be so important, they fade away. And so today we remember the origin story of Paul, or should I say Saul, who for better or worse, second to Jesus, is probably the most influential person in our Christian tradition. About a third of the New Testament is written or attributed to Paul. 
And we mostly know Saul as Paul because he used his Roman name in the second half of life on his mission to the wider Greco-Roman Gentile world. But for today, Paul is still rooted in his Hebrew tradition, and so he is Saul. But you'll forgive me if I call him Paul every once in a while on accident. So Saul and a few friends are walking down the road to Damascus. I imagine that Saul is one of those people who's very confident about the direction that he's going. His friends turn to him looking for his leadership. And in their bags, they carry papers from the high priests. And these papers give them authority to execute the honorable task at hand, to drive out the followers of Jesus, to place fear in their hearts, and even to imprison the most stubborn among them in order to make examples of them. Saul sees a great threat to the way of life that he loves so dearly. He will protect his faith and indeed protect his God. Surely this is a good and righteous task. And let's just say on the road to Damascus that day that Saul is blindsided. Saul and his crew, they are hyper-focused on their mission. Nothing will get in Saul's way. He has done his prep work and the way forward is clear. And then, bam! The defensive end of the Holy Spirit knocks Saul to his knees. A great light envelops him, blinds him, and a voice cries out, Saul, why do you persecute me? I love this question. God could cry out, threatening Saul, matching his own, Saul's own posture. God could be angry, rightfully so, for all of the suffering that Saul has caused. Instead, God is vulnerable. God identifies with the persecuted ones. God appeals to the love that God has for Saul, and God appeals to Saul's love for God. Yes, Saul's love is misdirected, distorted, and yet God is somehow able to seek goodness in him and reorient Saul towards that goodness. And isn't this what God is in the business of doing? Seeing the good in us and drawing it out, even when it's distorted, even when we are blind to the good in ourselves and the good in each other. So Saul, who is utterly confused, cries out, who are you? And the voice answers, I am Jesus. Go into town and wait for what to do next. And so Saul, the fearless leader, is now blinded. He must be led into the city by his friends. He waits in darkness, blinded for three days. He fasts from food and he prays. This man of action has to wait. Saul, who was so sure of himself, is now emptied out. The one riding high on the power of authority given him is now laid low. And in the end, this persecutor of the faith becomes one of its greatest ambassadors, indeed one of the reasons we are here today. And if I'm very honest, I do not want to identify with Saul. Perhaps, but perhaps the ones we want to disassociate with most are the ones who have the most to teach us. It is a terrible thought that I could mask my own stubbornness, yes, even my own moments of hatred and judgment with God's seal of approval and thereby doing great harm in God's name. This kind of rigid us versus them righteousness surely cannot be reflective of a posture that I would hold. But after deep reflection, I wonder, don't we all do this? Don't we all draw lines between us and them? Don't we all think some days that we would be God's great gift to those who are wrong in order to convert them to the true way? Don't we all at times hold on to these perceived righteous tasks 
with white knuckles, like somehow it earns us favor in God's eyes. And then thank God, all of the sudden, we have a moment of miraculous clarity and humility. When we realize that maybe accidentally we have been promoting wrongness with our stubborn perceived rightness. Maybe we are actually opposing divine goodness when we thought we were protecting it. Maybe the people that we thought belonged with them over there actually belong here with us. There are certainly times when our anger, our fear, or our need to be right cause great suffering. Secondly, I do not want to identify with Saul's state of broken humility. He has to start over, and I hate those times. I much prefer to be marching down the road with my buddies with a clear call, a clear path, and a righteous mission. Sitting in the dark, hungry, confused, with no clue about what will happen next, that is a vulnerable place. Nobody chooses that seat. And yet, for how many of us has that been our greatest hour of transformation, even our greatest hour of salvation, when we are saved from our own limited sight? And one of the interesting things about Saul is that his origin story is bound up with others, as all of our stories are. So we find Ananias, a follower of Jesus, who has heard that Saul of Tarsus is on the way. And that news is not good news. Saul has been known to storm into followers' homes and take them off to prison. Some of the followers of Jesus are surely tempted to hide or leave the movement altogether. And now God has called Ananias to be an agent of healing for this man. Now for me, it's easier to sympathize with Ananias. I imagine that Ananias and his loved ones are bracing for the persecution that is on the way. They huddle together and they wait for God's direction. And then one night, Ananias gets a vision from God. God's plan is for him to march up to Saul. And I can resonate with Ananias' question. Wait a second, God. This guy Saul, he is bad news. He has done evil and done these evil things to our people. Surely this is a very bad strategy. And God again tells Ananias to find Saul, to pray for him, to heal his blindness. For God's plan is to use Saul as an instrument to bring the good news of Jesus to the whole world. And in this moment, Ananias is also blindsided. His idea of us versus them, friend versus enemy, is disrupted. He has been preparing to defend his people. And God gives him the mission to approach Saul, to heal him. Even the one who has done this evil in God's name. Ananias' new vision calls him to risk his life in order to forgive and baptize his enemy, to call Saul his brother. You see, blindsided moments, they draw out the good in us. They draw us closer to God and to each other. And these moments also help us to see the good even in our enemy even in our most broken places within ourselves. And so when you get blindsided, pay attention. Sit in the dark and listen. Don't resist or flee because hidden in the dark are the moments of divine transformation, new life, new hope, new freedom. In these blindsided moments, we discover that the people we thought belonged to someone else over there, they are indeed our kin. In these moments, we are softened to reconcile with the one who has caused great suffering. And in these moments, we are called to be reconciled with God. 
because God still leans over us and gently asks, Beloved, why do you persecute me? And we might say to each other today, wait, how do we persecute you, O oh God? We are certainly not stoning people or imprisoning anyone. And God whispers back to us, did you see me hungry and feed me? Did you see me naked and clothe me? Did you see me in prison and come visit me? Or did you stand by? Did you ignore the suffering of the least of these? Sometimes I am blindsided by how ignorant I am of the suffering of others. And it's very painful when that ignorance comes into full view. Consider the suffering of a person of color driving down the road in a new community who has to question if their presence is a perceived threat. I have never had to negotiate that kind of question. How often do I ignore the suffering of the LGBTQ community, especially the transgender community in states like North Carolina, where some are afraid to use the bathroom? I've never had to bear that kind of fear. How many days am I sensitive to the suffering of the extreme poor in our partner organizations in Nicaragua, or even the suffering of those who don't have enough food to feed their kids right here in our community. Sometimes it's much easier to walk down the road with our heads held high in comfort and yes, in ignorance. And yet in our blindness, we are less whole. We are divided from each other and we are less connected to God. So the truth is that these moments of being blindsided by brokenness and by goodness are so often woven together. We can be blindsided by cancer and by hope all at the same time. So when we numb ourselves to our own suffering or to the suffering of others, we numb ourselves to grace and love. I emailed another Christchurch member this week to get her perspective on what it was like to be blindsided by cancer. Amanda Block is a Christchurch member, an advocate for the underserved, especially the homeless community, and a breast cancer survivor. Amanda writes, When my cancer was diagnosed, it was a shock. I was rushed for a mammogram, then rushed for an ultrasound and biopsies and appointments and tests to ascertain the type of cancer, and then chemotherapy. I had no time to react beyond handling the immediate needs and caring for my daughter, who was four at the time. And yet, the Sunday before my biopsies at church, we sang, God, who began a good work in you, will be careful to complete it. I sang this silently to myself through all of my tests, all of my scans. It held me together. When the nurses would give me a heavy sedative before chemo, I responded as if it were a truth serum. I asked everyone and anyone, what am I to do with this? What good can I make of it? I prayed, I waited, I got sick. Stuck in bed, I wondered what I was to do. Then with each passing day after chemo, I felt better. On the off weeks, I resumed my normal life, and on one of these days, my family and I went to the beach. The waves shifted the sand and revealed a dazzling array of stones and shells. My cancer was like the waves. It took off all the layers that held everything but my true essence, the grace and gratitude and joy that I prayed for every night for years had been revealed to me. It was already there all along. It was this discovery that oriented me more than my cancer. Bad things happen, 
We fight with the tools available to us, and it turns out the tools I expected to acquire, God had already instilled in me all along. I went on to have a successful finish to my chemo with a complete response. My surgery revealed no evidence of disease. The doctors tell me it's not over. It will never be over. So I put that grace to use living without fear of my future as best as I can, while being grateful and enjoying the good. And so, beloved, go now. Pay attention to the moments when the Holy Spirit blindsides you with goodness. And even when life blindsides you with suffering or with the suffering of others, because these moments are bound together in their sacredness. It is in these moments that God whispers to us, let go, go in this new way, even in the midst of your fear. Because Amanda is right, God's grace has always and will always be there. And paradoxically, sometimes we see God's grace more clearly when we are blinded and waiting in the dark. Amen.